Thank you, Victor, and thanks to all of you for coming for this early morning session. Um, I can assure you the euphoria of uh, Paris, COP21, when the Paris <clears throat> Agreement came into being, uh, we thought that was the high point, and you know, there on, it would be more a staid road of rolling up the sleeves to develop the modalities and procedures uh, for, for the rolling out of the Paris Agreement, but we had a surprise in store. Uh, the Paris Agreement got ratified in a record time of 10 months um, since uh, the formulation of the Paris Agreement. And just to give you a comparator, the Kyoto Protocol, which was agreed in 1997, took eight years for it to be ratified in 2005. So for the global community, this has been a real achievement to get uh, uh, get such an international agreement ratified in record time of 10 months, we could attribute it to the fact that President Obama wanted to, to leave a legacy on climate change, or that they were you know, thinking of various scenarios related to the outcome of the elections in the US, and well, lo and behold, one of those scenarios did come true, and the Marrakesh conference or negotiations took place uh, in that backdrop, and it was an interesting conference, uh, not as much energy as there was in Paris, but nevertheless, it's an important milestone, and Kristen will take you through some of the uh, key outcomes uh, from Marrakesh. Kristen. Uh, thank you very much, Priti, and thank you, Victor, for the kind words of introduction. Um, I w there's a lot of text on the slides that I'm going to present uh, now. I'm not going to go through all the text or expect you to read it. Uh, we are also going to post this on the web and share it. Uh, that's why there's so much text. Uh, but I'm trying to live in it, liven it up a little bit also with impressions from uh, the COP uh, that happened in Marrakesh. So I'm very glad to see the large interest by, that kind of shows the commitment of the institution and interest of the institution in climate change as well. Not quite 22,500 people or so as there were at the COP. So this was for me one of the largest COPs apart from Paris uh, that I've been to. And we also had quite significant presence by heads of state, not, the, not Obama and Merkel, but you know, uh, some of other heads of states and then of course a lot of ministers representing their delegations. Uh, as pretty said, the Paris Agreement just entered into, fourth on fourth of no uh, into force on 4th of November. Uh, up to now, there's 115 countries that have ratified it. Um, that ticker goes up every day, uh, so we're keeping an eye on it. It ended with the official proclamation, uh, Marrakesh Action Proclamation, um, which you can check up on later if you would like so. The main point is that the Marrakesh Action Proclamation reaffirms that uh, we need, now need to enter an era of action and implementation. So that's really the main point there. Um, nothing very much new in terms of big uh, decisions um, that, that would shake the world after the Paris Agreement had just come into force. So it was very much about maintain, maintaining the momentum and then um, working on f defining the rules. Non-state action also featured quite strongly uh, in this uh, COP. So that's a picture of the uh, first night uh, we were there. I think that was probably going into the night uh, of the US election. Uh, they're over the tents of, of, of uh, the COP venue in Marrakesh. Um, the point is really that uh, the Paris Agreement established a framework and the big decisions, and now um, the, this COP22 moved towards implementation and uh, action and filling those decisions that were taken in Paris with rules and methods and uh, guidance going forwards. So for example, the Paris Agreement would say there, is a, there shall be a carbon market uh, and then now the parties are working on defining what that means and how it will work. That's just being one example. The timeline for this is now very ambitious. They decided to have a timeline of uh, 2018, so there will be end of 2018 the COP and working throughout 2017 and 2018 to get there and defining all the rules. If we see that the ratification of the Kyoto Protocol took eight years alone and during that time they spent all the time also working on the, on the methods and, and on the rule book, uh, this is a very, very ambitious timeline. Um, 
one of the nice murals in, in, in the old town of, uh, of Marrakesh, just to say, you know, we have, it kind of reminded me of where we kind of start and then we'll keep going around the wall, defining rules with a lot of script uh, in between. There's much left to discuss and to define in the, in the rule book. Uh, one of the cornerstones of the Paris Agreement uh, were the nationally determined contributions and nearly all of our member countries, for example, have submitted their INDC, uh, that's intended nationally determined contribution to the Paris Agreement. And um, the point is now that these are being converted to nationally determined contributions without the I. And up to 2018, there will be a process of stock taking. So saying uh, which will be, be the rules for which will be defined next year. So that's to say, where do we stand? What's the ambition of, IND, of individual nationally de determined contributions, for example? And what do they cumulatively add up to? Um, the countries are sharing progress on implementation of the INDCs, and that was part of the uh, action also around, uh, around the COP with countries announcing, for example, uh, revisions on their INDCs, also the, um, uh, some countries pub publishing uh, long-term decarbonization plans and strategies, and very interestingly also, especially most of some of the uh, least developed countries and most vulnerable countries announcing very ambitious plans towards uh, for example, moving towards 100% renewable. We have 17, I think, of our DMCs uh, among that group of the Climate Vulnerable Forum that want to go uh, re completely renewable as soon as possible. Um, just a picture outside of, of the uh, compound in Marrakesh. Um, the NDCs, of course, being what countries plan to do, and um, as I mentioned briefly before, three of our uh, two of our countries, uh, DMCs, Pakistan and Indonesia, have actually increased in emission between what they had thought of as INDC and now what is being incorporated as, uh, incorporated as NDC uh, in the agreement. Some of the individual topics, adaptation and loss, of, loss and damage, featured very uh, strongly, especially adaptation and resilience. Um, in terms of the work being done on this topic, it was mostly about communicating and measuring and reporting on adaptation commitments and implementation and the financing and support needs uh, therefore. Um, because a lot of this is not necessarily covered under the NDC because uh, that uh, well, there's a <laughs> complicated background on that one. The interesting part um, under the item of loss and damage was that, uh, or good for us, that part was that the Standing Committee on Finance uh, was very appreciative of our help in hosting their session in September here in ADB headquarters, and even the final decision uh, expresses its gratitude uh, for our work and help there. On the sidelines of all the official uh, parts, um, it's, it's very interesting to see uh, over the last years, the countries have really taken up showcasing their work and their commitment to the process. Uh, there's a lot of country pavilions. They, on the one hand, offer office space for the country, mission, uh, country representatives and delegations to work, but also have event spaces and showcases and so on. So uh, a lot of things now happen in the China pavilion. Um, some of the other countries, for example, Thailand here, they also had their own speaker's corner where they hosted events, uh, and those were really quite an addition to the official side events uh, that, that happen at every COP. On climate finance, um, although this is a big slide uh, with a lot of text, uh, there's not uh, very significant new outcomes in terms of climate finance. The, um, there were some new pledges to the adaptation fund, um, there's, there were launches of various initiatives, more official initiatives or uh, more kind of corporate or uh, partnership type of initiatives. Um, but really the cornerstone is still the commitment that was initially given in Copenhagen and then reaffirmed in the Paris Agreement of mobilizing 100, million, 100 billion a year in terms of climate finance from developed to developing countries. Um, that in the Paris Agreement was fixed with uh, a latest update and increase by 2025, but there's no new numbers or so, so this previous commitment still stands in terms of climate finance. 
one more impression of, of a very beautiful pavilion actually uh, of Indonesia and right next to it was, was India, which is always very impressive. They always have uh, kind of water fountains and, and, and uh, so uh, it's also a very, very good chance for countries to showcase themselves. As Marrakesh also very uh, craftily used that chance to, to show, showcase themselves as a host of a big convention. Um, in terms of climate technology, um, there was also not very much news. There were announcement, uh, there was an announcement of new funding towards the Climate Technology um, uh, Center and Network, um, which is the implementation arm of, of the uh, climate uh, technology part of the convention. Um, but uh, not much different news on that. As I said, uh, the market mechanisms, for example, have been uh, implemented or established uh, in Article 6 of the Paris Agreement. Um, they might become uh, interesting for us at a, at a later point. At the moment, it's really in initial stages of discussions under the rule book uh, track of uh, the negotiations. Uh, they requested for countries to submit some views on particular items by March of 2017. So by then we can probably see where some of also our member countries stand on the, in terms of uh, climate um, or market mechanisms towards um, achieving the convention. And then of course in the middle of the, of the week we had the supermoon. This is not the sun over the desert, but the supermoon over the desert. So um, we, uh, I don't know if it kept anybody from sleeping, but at least it guided our way. We worked uh, very late every day, so uh, we had a good light uh, coming home through the narrow alleyways of, of uh, Marrakesh that can be quite dark, actually. Interestingly, non-state climate action has, was a very important feature of, of this COP as well. So there's an increasing recognition that the an international agreement on climate change isn't everything. So that there's a role for actors and, and, and uh, parties and groups of those uh, beyond uh, nation states uh, that are party to the convention. So um, there was a, uh, this was mentioned very strongly in the uh, Marrakesh Partnership for Climate Action, Global Climate Action, which was announced. There are um, two high-level champions, as they are called, uh, for climate action, the current Minister for Environment of, uh, of Morocco and Laurence Tubiana uh, from France, the previous COP. So they really championed this, this cause for climate action, meaning that um, cities are announcing climate plans, corporations are announcing climate plans, NGOs are contributing groups of those are coming together as partnerships and initiatives with their own targets, with their own goals. And um, the ambition is really to, um, of, of this uh, Global Climate Action Partnership, to build a bit of a framework to coordinate this work and um, well, make it more comparable, register it. And uh, interestingly, I think uh, there's still a large need for developing countries to play a more important role in this non-state climate action. I think it's not as visible as it is for, uh, for uh, developed countries and that was noted in the, on the sidelines of the official events as well. Just a showcase of, uh, this is the official NASCA registry platform of the UNFCCC with a lot of cities, uh, regions and so on registering for this. And this is very much increasing all the time. Um, a little bit different uh, focus, what I mean by partnerships and initiatives here. There was, were a lot of announcements of new partnerships and initiatives, for example, on countries and governments and uh, organizations coming together to support in the NDC implementation and others still as uh, the like. Uh, one more that, is, uh, that we're keeping a, a very close eye on is the Insure Resilience Partnership meant to support climate risk insurance uh, for uh, developing countries. Um, on the, the NDC partnership, for example, a number of our um, member countries have joined and some of the other MDBs as well. And we're keeping an eye on it to see uh, all of us are committed to working with countries on implementing their NDCs and we're, we're seeing if this particular initiative that seems to be the largest at the moment can be a forum where ADB can engage as well. 
Our activities, um, we were very present um, in, in terms of, um, well, our little delegation of, of two people plus Deborah Katzmann also joined from ERO uh, for uh, a presentation and a day at the COP. Um, we presented at events, presented at the official uh, UNFCC session, pretty uh, talked about the MDB uh, joint action on climate finance. Um, we had a lot of uh, bilateral meetings, so we spent a good uh, chunk of time with our countries, our member countries, uh, talking, for example, about our um, climate change strategic framework for 2030 that uh, we're at the moment developing, and um, meeting with donor countries or uh, uh, contributor countries to some of the funds, meeting with some of the international organizations and the Deputy Prime Minister of Tonga, for example, and these kind of things. Also working with the MDB's group on coordination. So we have an official flag at the, at the COPS uh, where we can sit and uh, I don't know if we can even raise it or not and say anything, um, but I don't think it's been ever done. <laughs> so that was mostly empty, that space. We also weren't able to go to all the events, uh, hear the invitation to the lunch with the king that we unfortunately had to decline because we had to work and, and uh, sit around there instead. Um, just some, some pictures and impressions of, of us being active at the COP. And with that, on some concluding remarks, hand it over to Priti. Um, as uh, the impression uh, Christian provided, uh, this was more like a working COP, so there were no major new official announcements. Of course, lots of partnerships and initiatives launched, which, which is kind of signaling uh, that the world is moving behind, uh, beyond the role of governments to, into non-state actors and ensuring that you know, climate action does take place after the historic Paris Agreement. In terms of the takeaways for ADB uh, from, from this recently concluded Marrakesh um, conference, I would say there are three major takeaways. The first one relates to, as Christian was talking about, the nationally determined contributions. These are climate pledges that have been made by our member countries. So they give us a very good entry point to engage with our countries, maybe through the country programming missions, to create uh, to create or solicit, uh, you know, demand for ADB support, uh, to what extent could we partner with our countries to help them achieve their climate pledges or also to ramp up their ambition as they are expected to do in the context of the Paris Agreement. So that's an important takeaway, irrespective of the fact whether we join this big NDC partnership or not. Uh, in terms of our work, uh, I think that's where we would uh, be working closely with operations departments. Uh, the second is the the theme of adaptation and resilience, it, it really resonated during this, uh, this COP and it, it, it is also uh, kind of uh, encouraging us because in our climate change strategic framework we are also talking about how ADB could contribute to building resilience in our DMCs and there is a matching of <clears throat> I, I, I can say interest from countries and what ADB is proposing to do in our climate change strategic framework. And one important point over here related to adaptation and resilience is the next presidency of the COP, each COP is, is hosted by a country. Uh, the next COP uh, is going to be hosted by Fiji, one of our very important developing member countries. And, uh, you know, given the vulnerability of the Pacific region, I'm sure Fiji as the presidency will also ramp up the discussions on adaptation and resilience. So to what extent can we support Fiji in bringing this forth in, in, in the next conference is also a, a, an important takeaway for ADB in providing support to this process and to our DMCs. Uh, the third important thing, uh, uh, you know, a takeaway, as Christian mentioned, this is the time for developing the rule book. And in terms of the rule book, of course, you know, be it related to the mitigation efforts or adaptation efforts of climate financing, all this will come into play, but what we have to keep a watch out for, based on our past experiences, also the market mechanisms, uh, ADB with its Asia Pacific uh, Carbon Fund and the Future Carbon Fund was really, you know, up there out in the front, looking at how carbon markets develop and help our DMCs tap those. So to what extent would we be ready to play an important role in this region on 
maybe an, as an aggregator of the market mechanisms or, or as a facilitator or a clearinghouse is something that we are looking out for, especially in the context of one of our big countries, China, rolling out its national emissions trading system next year. So, you know, to what extent can, can we build on that momentum and what's happening in some other countries related to developing their domestic market mechanisms? So these are three important takeaways. And um, what, what I'd say finally is um, this COP was very important in, uh, in seeing how China is emerging as a leader on climate action with a vacuum left by the outcome of various political developments. I think China has really taken, um, taken that lead and it was very evident during the interventions made by China, during the various events hosted by China at the China Pavilion and that is a very, very encouraging sign for us. To what extent would we be ready to play an important role in this region on maybe an, as an aggregator of the market mechanisms or, or as a facilitator or a clearinghouse is something that we are looking out for, especially in the context of one of our big countries, China, rolling out its national emissions trading system next year. So, you know, to what extent can, can we build on that momentum and what's happening in some other countries related to developing their domestic market mechanisms? Attention, and we are happy to take any questions that you may have. Thank you, Priti and Christian. Uh, just two quick questions, you know. Uh, let us just talk about, you know, elephant in the room. Now, how did, the, you know, COP22 really respond to the potentials of U.S. pulling out from the home framework? You know, I just want to, you know, have a little more direct expression of what is really going on. Question number one. Question number two, in Christian's area slide, there's a number or amount of money, 100 billion mentioned. I wasn't really sure you know, whether that is for whatever the number of, you know, year period. But then, actually, even as the annual amount, 100 billion looks too small for me because ADB alone, we're talking about, you know, 6 billion a year, okay, by 2020. Or China alone, you know, probably will be spending, you know, more than that amount every year in any case. Then, I mean, what, what that, I mean, that 100 billion, and we still, you know, sort of struggling with 100 billion, and can't we even go one digit more? I mean, what's, what's, what's wrong with that? Thank you, Ayumi-san. Um, yes, uh, you know, the fact that um, the outcome of, of where U.S. would be heading towards did, uh, I would say, create a bit of a shout uh, in the first week. Um, of, of the climate negotiations, especially when the results came out. But I think the Marrakesh proclamation was, was a sign of sol solidarity from the rest of the world that regardless of that outcome, the climate action would, would proceed. And if you, you know, uh, if one heard uh, John Kerry speaking at, at the climate conference, uh, he also reiterated the fact that regardless of, and you have to read between the lines in his speech, that regardless of the outcome of, you know, what's happened in the U.S. and what the next, uh, you know, regime would, uh, would do or not do on climate action, there is a lot of private sector action taking place in the U.S. And that momentum will continue regardless of the government walking out. So, so in that sense, uh, I, I would say, you know, uh, the train has <laughs> left the station. So, so you know, regardless of U.S. Uh, inaction or action, things will move in the rest of the world. And in that context, I think uh, China really is trying to fill that vacuum and taking the, seizing it as an opportunity. And it was very, very evident in the, you know, the, the last week of the conference. Um, on the 100 billion, you're right. 100 billion was a politically agreed number. And, you know, developing countries have always said or always argue in the climate negotiations that, you know, 100 billion is not enough. This is not enough to look if we look at the needs uh, of developing countries. But since it is, it, it is a politically negotiated agreement, 100 billion is the number that we live with. And it's 100 billion annually from 2020 onwards. What was 
somewhat heartening in Paris, in the Paris Agreement, was that by 2025, there would be an upping of that ambition of 100 billion. But, but you're right. Uh, you know, this 100 billion number is something we have to live with, and the needs are much, much higher than the 100 billion. Krista? Yeah. Ah, Cindy, yes, please. Thank you, Preeti, Christian. Um, to ADB, uh, you, we've done a lot, there's a lot of momentum about uh, marking our financing for climate finance, leveraging our own resources. Could you say a little bit more about our experience now with GCF, Adaptation Fund, and how, um, how ADB can work a little bit harder to leverage some of these grant resources, especially for our less resourced and very climate vulnerable DMCs? Thanks, Cindy. Um, I'll let Christian respond on the Green Climate Fund since he's been working very, very uh, hard on it and very closely with, with the operations departments as well. On the Adaptation Fund, I think you've raised a very, very relevant point. We have not been able to tap the Adaptation Fund as yet uh, because of some legal issues, and I think it's time to revisit. Earlier we had said, you know, it's a small fund. Let's not, you know, put too much effort into it. But in, um, in Marrakesh, now it is, you know, with, with the push from developing countries, uh, it was decided uh, that Adaptation Fund would also be a fund of the Paris Agreement. Of course, the final decision will be taken two years from now, but developing countries have been able to, you know, break that lock of the Adaptation Fund with the Kyoto Protocol and make it also a fund for the future climate regime. So that's an important development, and that's why we need to revisit our, our relationship with the Adaptation Fund and how we can engage with it, and we'll work with OGC soon to revive that. But Kristen can tell you more about what he's doing in the engine room on the Green Climate Fund. Right, uh, thank you. Um, on the GCF, we have uh, some, some positive experience already. As you know, this builds on the work we've been doing on the climate investment funds, which is to date our largest co-financing source for climate change projects. So on the GCF, we, we have a 31 million uh, project approved, uh, 31 million from their side to combine with a larger infrastructure investment by ADB and, and other co-financiers in Fiji. And we are quite uh, hopeful that very soon in two weeks or so in, in the next GCF board meeting, we'll get another approval, uh, which um, is at the moment in the works, and that would kickstart kind of the a renewable energy project uh, program for the Pacific. So um, we have some experience there. We are talking with uh, individuals across all the operational departments about uh, different possibilities and then working on developing through the project cycle, that uh, project processing cycle of uh, any proposals that we're doing with the GCF. I think one important thing to keep in mind is that um, the Green Climate Fund, and for us to, to be able to use it as lev to leverage and increase our own um, uh, spending on, on relevant projects, they're really looking for very innovative and paradigm shifting uh, uh, projects as they say. So we are focusing equally as, as much as on the concrete project preparation, also on working uh, with everybody to get climate change considerations earlier on in the process in ADB. So that in the country partnership strategies, we have a very solid foundation for climate change uh, projects and that we, uh, that country programming missions, as Priti has said, also focus on identifying opportunities for climate change projects so that we can really bring projects to the GCF that, um, that have a very strong climate change core there to it and then expand our, through that way, expand our uh, own use of climate finance from our own resources. 